Hi, everybody, and welcome to the latest podcast for Honors Biology at Desert Ridge High School. I'm Mr. Galladay, and today we're going to be talking about active transport. Active transport does not involve airplanes, planes, trains, automobiles, or anything like that. Active transport, uh, in a biological sense, refers to moving things around in cells, and specifically moving things around in cells that won't move on their own. This is a good place to update your table of contents, update your uh, organization in your notebook, and here we go. Uh, we've already talked about the idea of this the cell membrane, uh, and that it is this thing that is made of something called a phospholipid bilayer. The phospholipid bilayer, as we have said before, is these uh, funny little molecules that have a phosphate part that is hydrophilic, that is that it is very interactive with water, and it also contains a lipid tail. The lipid tail, of course, wants absolutely nothing to do with water. So the lipids interact with each other, uh, and then the phosphates hang out with the water molecules that are outside of the cell uh, on one side, and then on the other side they hang out with the water that is on the inside of the cell. In between the layers you have these things that are called these proteins. Uh, these membrane proteins. So we say that we have a mosaic of proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, just a whole bunch of different types of molecules that are sort of uh, interwoven together kind of like as we say like a, uh, like a mosaic. So the main material of the, the, uh, the cell membrane is the phospholipids but there are also lots and lots of proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids and so on uh, that make up this thing. The function of the uh, cell membrane, of course, is, yes, that's right, to control what comes in and out of the cell. Uh, the, um, this is done, so here's an, uh, another, layer, or another view. Um, this is done primarily uh, by these, uh, these proteins that are embedded in the, uh, in the, uh, the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so this is another type of view, uh, and in this in this view, the, the top part represents the outside of the cell. The bottom view, or the, or the bottom part, represents the part that's inside the cell. So that's the cytoplasm. And then we have a couple different types of, of proteins. One of these, this is, this is showing sort of a cutaway view of this thing. Uh, but if we were to see the thing intact, it would look kind of like a tube. Uh, and so this tube is what we call a channel protein. Channel proteins allow some substances to cross the cell membrane by diffusion. Um, if they are the right shape, if they are the right size, then they can easily fit through that tube and they can diffuse from an area of high concentration to a low concentration. And since they do that across the cell membrane, uh, if water is involved, then that is, uh, that's of course osmosis. So facilitated diffusion does not require any energy. All it requires is to have a protein and to have a high concentration of whatever that stuff is on one side, a low concentration on the other, and then uh, just by diffusion this stuff will move from the high concentration to the low concentration. On the other hand, we have other types of uh, cell membranes that look like this, and you see that there's only an arrow going one direction. That's because this thing is a pump. Uh, pump proteins, just as the name implies, um, they require energy, right? And energy, of course, is a form of active transport. Just like running a pump, if you were going to pump water from deep underground up to the surface of the earth, that requires energy to do that. Uh, so um, whether it's electricity or from a gasoline or diesel engine, it still requires a form of energy. Uh, in cell membranes, we're moving molecules from one side outside uh, of the cell to the inside of the cell and we may be moving them against their concentration gradient that is to say that's analogous to moving it uphill uh, and if we do that that requires a form of energy and we'll see how that works uh, in in today's vodcast okay so uh, here's a little table that will be very useful to you that ki kind of compares and contrasts passive as transport to active transport. Passive transport does not require any energy. It re, uh, all it requires is molecules that are moving on their own, uh, so there's no energy required. Osmosis and diffusion are familiar examples of 
passive transport. The molecules move from high concentration to low concentration, uh, and so they do that all on their own. No energy is required. Um, facilitated diffusion is an example of passive transport. Osmosis is a form of passive transport. On the other hand, active transport does require energy. It, uh, these are moving substances um, from a low concentration to a high concentration, so they require some energy. For cells, ATP, something that we'll learn about today, adenosine triphosphate, is the source of that cell energy. So molecules are moved against their concentration, so we have to move them from a low concentration to a high concentration. That requires energy to do that. And so that is where this active transport stuff comes in. Uh, we usually require some very specialized protein to do this, and we usually call those pumps, uh, is, the, is sort of the generic term for that. Okay, before we get into this, we need just a very quick description of what do we mean by energy. Well, our formal definition, or the physical definition of energy, is the ability to do work. Now, this doesn't mean that molecules have jobs and get paid. What this means uh, is that they are moving some mass for some distance. Anytime you have moved a mass over some distance, uh, by definition, you have done some work. Uh, so if you move a bowling ball across a room, you have done some work. If you move a marble uh, for one inch, you've done a little bit less work. If you move a molecule from one side of a membrane to another against its concentration gradient, you have done some work. That doesn't seem like very much, but if you multiply that by trillions of cells, uh, and each cell has millions or thousands of, of different pumps that are doing this, that uh, adds up to a very large amount of energy indeed. Um, now when we talk about work and energy, we, are, we have some observable effects. Uh, one of them at, at our human scale that we're of course very familiar with is kinetic energy. When we move an object, when a baseball pitcher throws a baseball, he's caused a, some, kinetic, some observable kinetic energy. He's caused a mass to move over some distance. Same thing if you kick a football or if you have a slap shot on a, uh, on a hockey puck. Same thing, you've moved a mass for some distance. That's kinetic energy. Um, another common example is heat energy. Uh, we can see the example, we can see the effects of moving molecules. Uh, in this case, we've got cold water on the left, hot water on the right. And the observable effect is that the molecules are moving much more rapidly. So the, the dye molecules that we have put into the, uh, the, two water, uh, the two water cups um, diffuses much more rapidly on the right than it does on the left. Okay. Again, that's because of the kinetic energy of these moving molecules inside uh, this, this uh, cup of warm water. Uh, another example is light energy. Now, this is a, uh, often the result of a, a, uh, some reaction or some other uh, thing that, uh, that's taking place. In this case, it's electrical energy being converted into light energy, but they are moving photons and that is uh, an observable source of energy. Um, these fireworks, uh, we have two different types of energy going on. You have chemical reactions taking place in the explosions of the fireworks, and those are releasing energy in the form of light. Uh, we observe the photons that are released from the, the reactions, um, and those are uh, basically the electrons that are moving uh, as we form uh, new types of uh, new, new types of, of uh, chemical products as a result of the reaction. Okay, when we actively transport substances in or out of the cell, that requires energy. Exocytosis, this is a term you need to know. Exocytosis is one way that cells uh, expel or cause uh, things to move out of the cell, right? The exo means out of, and the cyto refers to the cell. Uh, so we're, we're causing material to be removed from the cell. This is a vacuole. Here's our cell membrane. So we're moving, we're going to move these molecules out of the cell against their concentration gradient. So if we cause these, this material to be exited, we have moved a mass over some distance. We have done some work that required some energy to do that. 
The opposite of this is endocytosis. In endocytosis, we can bring material in against its concentration gradient. So now if we imagine that this is, a, is some food particles or some material that the cell wants to acquire, right? Uh, the cell can form a vacuole around that material and transport it into the cytoplasm of the cell. We've moved some molecules over a distance. We've done some work. Uh, so energy was needed to do that, right? Exocytosis and endocytosis are both examples of active transport, right? Um, another form, well, the, the energy source for this, uh, this work that we've done is something called ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Um, adenosine triphosphate is made up of uh, there are four parts in that. There is an adenosine, um, a molecule of something called adenosine, which is very similar to a sugar. Um, and then there are three phosphate molecules, which are all sort of chained together in this way. Now, I sometimes use an analogy of a rechargeable battery to refer to adenosine triphosphate. That is not a perfect analogy, but it helps you to, may help you to understand what's going on. Um, in adenosine triphosphate, this is now our charged battery, uh, and there is a small amount of energy that is released when that battery discharges. So here's our adenosine triphosphate, and if you watch very closely, you'll see the energy being released, and bam, there it was. Once that, uh, that battery is discharged, now we have our adenosine and two phosphates, so that is called adenosine diphosphate plus we have a phosphate because matter of course cannot be destroyed uh, but it moved from a high energy uh, configuration to a low energy configuration when it did that you saw that little burst of energy uh, which was released and that's what happens when ATP is discharged okay so I'll show you that one more time so in order to charge our uh, our battery back up uh, we have to get put it into a battery charger. We have to add energy. Uh, so to charge that battery, it requires a, a, a source of energy. We'll see how that do happens in, a, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and so now with our charged battery, we can use this ATP molecule to do some work. And we do it by converting it to ADP. Boom, there was our uh, little release of energy. Um, and so that uh, is what does some work. So Again, the important thing to know about ATP um, is that when I am going to charge my battery, that is when I'm going to take ADP and add a phosphate on, I need to add energy. Um, when I have an ATP uh, and I discharge it by converting it to ADP plus P, I release energy. Okay, so that release of energy is what does our, the work in our cell. Uh, one form of work that is done in our cells is, of course, these pumps that we've talked about. Now I'm going to show you a, uh, again, this is sort of a, um, oh, this, you could think of this as sort of a, uh, this gives you a sort of an idea of what, uh, what this thing, how these things work. This is not what this looks like at all, but uh, it gives you an idea. Um, this is our uh, phospholipid bilayer, so the these yellow uh, pieces here are the phosphates. The lipid tails, of course, are down here. So here's our phospholipid bilayer. This big green thing is our pump. Um, and this is done to maintain homeostasis in the cell. Okay, uh, So our molecular pump is this big green uh, doodad here. And uh, the conditions of the cell look like this. We've got lots of sodium outside the cell. We've got lots of potassium inside the cell. Okay. If this was allowed to go on its own, uh, what would happen? The potassium would, by diffusion, uh, could diffuse out of the cell. The sodium could diffuse into the cell because we have a high concentration of sodium outside, high concentration of potassium inside. The cell doesn't want this. The cell wants the sodium outside. The cell wants the potassium inside. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means if there's any sodium that's inside, we've got to pump it out. We've got to pump it against its concentration gradient from low concentration inside to a high concentration. That takes energy. What's our source of energy? 
ATP, that's right. So we've got our high concentration of sodium outside, high concentration of potassium inside. So our ATP comes over uh, and breaks down into ADP plus a phosphate. When that happens, uh, we get a little boom. There was our little flash of energy. If you missed it, let's see it one more time. There it is. So you saw that little flash of energy. Uh, that energy was released from this uh, breakdown. Uh, and that's going to pump that sodium, that little explosion is going to just squirt that sodium right outside the cell. And the other thing that's going to happen is that a potassium now is going to be pumped into the cell. All of that from one ATP. Okay, so we pumped our sodium out, we pumped our potassium in. In both cases that was against the concentration gradient, uh, and so that of course took some energy, but that has the effect of increasing the concentration of sodium outside the cell, increasing the concentration of potassium inside the cell. Okay, so here's our little animation that just runs on and on by itself, and you see that the, uh, the pump takes a constant supply of ATP. Now, each one of your cells has thousands of these little pumps. And these little pumps all day, all night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, holidays, Christmas, every single day, every minute of your life, these little pumps are working away. Uh, and they take a constant supply of ATP uh, to do that. They take a constant source of energy to do that. How, where we get all this energy, we'll see uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, but the, the, the important thing to know is this. This cell requires constant energy to maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis is the condition that has lots of sodium, or I'm sorry, potassium inside the cell, lots of sodium outside the cell. Okay. Um, so again, here is our uh, quick comparison between passive transport not required molecules move down the concentration gradient facilitated diffusion requires a channel but no energy osmosis and diffusion are your examples active transport does require energy ATP is the source of that energy right molecules are moved against their concentration gradient uh, and so that requires some protein pumps um, so our examples are exocytosis, endocytosis, and protein pumps. Those are all examples of active transport. Okay, so if you're tired out from all this talk about energy and all of this uh, talking about active transport and all this act active stuff, you might need a little passive rest. So here's a little introduction to passive napping. So hope you have a great day, and this has been Mr. Galladay for Honors Biology at Desert Ridge High School.